Blessings. Hi, pet pet. Happy belated birthday, my darling. Hello, hello everyone. Welcome. Welcome to another episode of Womb Wednesdays, hosted by me, uh, Ramona Riley, aka The Vagina Lady and owner of Cosmic Woman. I am excited, as I always am, uh, for a Wednesday Live, just so that we can talk a little bit more in depth about something hormonal, something reproductive, something that we're probably really suffering from, maybe that we know it's consciously or subconsciously. Of course, if this is your second, third, twentieth time here today, uh, thank you so much uh, for joining in. You know that usually I speak about the things that people don't want to talk about or people don't like to talk about um, or people don't even know they should be talking about it. So of course I am here to break down those barriers. Uh, but tonight is actually questions and answers. And I always love questions and answers because it allows people to be able to get a bit of an understanding of what really is going on with them. Uh, so that they can now make a conscious effort to do what they need to do for their healing or for their treatment. So really, really, really excited about that. So everyone who's just coming on, welcome again, welcome. I am going to start with prayer. I start with prayer every single Wednesday. And from there, we are going to dive right into the questions and the answers. If you want to do a video question and answers, that is also a very much a possibility. So just send your requests um, as an invitee, or you can just put your question up um, along here so I can see it. All right, so let's bow our heads or do what we would usually do for prayer, and I will lead the prayer. Dear God, myself, everyone on this live, everyone who will watch this live later on, we just come to you so grateful. Grateful for everything that you have provided. The blessings, yes, the unconditional love, of course. We're also grateful for you creating things that can help us heal our bodies and maintain our wellness. We also thank you for the support, maybe family or friends that we have around us. We ask you now to just continue to hold us close and bring peace to our hearts and also to our minds. Amen. Okay. Mm -hmm. Questions mm -hmm. and answers. Now I'm going to, of course, go ahead and speak as the questions come in. I will answer them. So one of the questions that I get a lot of times is, I'm trying to get pregnant and it's not happening. What can I do? What should I do? And I would usually say, okay, have you done all your tests? Have you done those main tests that you need to do? Not the extra ones that then cost the extra amount of money or you have to go and see a specialist necessarily, um, like a fertility specialist or that type of thing. I'm talking about the regular old surgery, um, the, regu <laughs> the regular old tests that an OBGYN can do or a general doctor can refer you to do other all these different types of tests. Now, there are three tests that we want to concentrate on. One is a pap smear. Now, the pap smear is just a test that every woman should do at least once a year. Depending on your location, your insurance might not cover every year. It might cover every two years or every three years, just based on where you are. Whatever it is that they will allow, do that, okay? But I would definitely, if you can get a pap smear done every year, just to see, just to know, just to look. It's always better to be safe than sorry. 
okay and when we do a pap smear what we're looking for is actually what's going on with the cervix we can't see the cervix from an ultrasound we can't see the cervix from a laparoscopy from that way we'd see it from the other way and still it still would kind of be weird so we want to understand that a pap smear is important it's the only way that we can see what your cervix what kind of health is your cervix in? Is there mm -hmm. any precancerous cells there? Uh, is it damaged? Uh, we just want to know. The other test that you would do is an HSG test. The HSG test is going to be testing your tubes. Now, a lot of times when we think about fertility and pregnancy and all of that, we forget about the tubes. Forgetting that the tubes are very important. We can't really get pregnant without the tubes, right? From, from a natural standpoint. So we want to look at the tubes. We want to know what do the tubes look like? Is there damage to the tube? Is there scar tissue? Is there some type of blockage? What is going on with the tubes? The other test that you want to do is a pelvic ultrasound. Now, you don't want to do just a regular pelvic ultrasound. You want to do a transvaginal pelvic ultrasound. A regular ultrasound would be done on your abdomen, and they would just use the thing and put the little gel thing on your belly and towards your vagina, and they would just look around and see what's there. A lot of times, you can't really see anything from there, okay? You want to make sure it is a transvaginal or ultrasound, which means that it would be shaped like how that um, the douche bottle, how the top of the douche bottle is usually shaped. It's shaped like that, but a little fatter. And they insert it inside the vagina, and then they can see everything other than the cervix in terms of in terms mm -hmm. of what exactly the cervix looks cervix looks like, right? But it is important to do those three tests. Transvaginal ultrasound, okay? That's gonna be able to tell, let us know what your ovaries look like, um, what your uterus looks like, what your bladder looks like, what your kidneys look like, okay? That's gonna be the transvaginal. The HSG is going to be about the tubes and the health of the tubes and if there's blockage or no blockage. And then the pap smear itself is just something every woman should be doing from she turns 18, okay? Um, if you are sexually active from earlier out, then you should be doing it before you're 18, okay? In terms of the pap smear. So the pap smear is not really about getting pregnant. The pap smear is just about overall freaking health. Okay, you want to get pregnant, you don't want to get pregnant, you're having sex, you're not having sex, you still need to be doing a pap smear, okay? Every, as often as you can. If you can do it once a year, great. If you can't afford to because you're paying insurance and your insurance covers it and it says only twice a year or three times, um, only every two years or every three years, then do it every two years, every three years. But get it done. Don't let too much time go by, Okay. How is the HSG test done? Okay, so the HSG test, um, it is literally like a dye that they pump through the tubes to see how the dye moves through the tube. So you, they'll realize that there's no spill, spillover to the other side. So that means there's some blockage. The, the, the dye can't pass that area. Uh, so that's basically how you do it. Depending on your cycle, they really want you to come in at a certain point of your cycle. So when it is that you're going to do an HSG test, or you want to, I say, do an HSG test, when you call your OBGYN, um, once you have told them what you want to do, they will ask you what was your last period, blah, 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 blah. And then they will tell you, okay, this is when you need to come in so that they can it will be the best time during your cycle to do the HSG test. There is another test that you can do that can test to see your eggs in terms of how much, you know, what's going on there. Um, and if you're ovulating, there is a test for that as well. Uh, of course, when you start doing those types of tests that come into more of a fertility situation, you find that things become a lot more expensive than at that basic aspect. Uh, so not everyone would usually do a test like that. But if that's something that you can financially do, then by all means do that. 
Uh, but I don't usually recommend my clients to do that um, because there's no there's no need to. If you're not ovulating, then we get you to ovulate. <laughs> That's just what it is. Um, and so there's really no need to do that. But again, there's some people that really want to know, need to know. And if you're going to go to a fertility specialist, they're definitely going to do that test to see if you're ovulating or not. Right, okay, so some places don't do pap smears till 21, especially overseas. Okay, and that's what it is. I mean, you just go with what you can go with, okay? If you can afford to do it um, without insurance or whatever the case is, do that. If not, you can't, you know what I mean? If this is what the standard is and it's 21, then that's what the standard is. We're living with all other types of standards that shouldn't apply to us anyway. So, I mean, I guess that extra one, you know, it's, what, it's whatever. So when it comes to that whole getting pregnant, as I said, the tests are very, very, very important. The more we know about what's going on with your body is the more that we can do. I say this to my clients every day I have a consultation with them. The more I know is the more I can do. If I don't know, I can't do anything about it, right? How can you tell you are ovulating without those tests? Okay, so... Ovulation is, for most women, is anywhere from 12 to 18 days after your period. For me personally, my, I ovulate much earlier than that, okay? So we don't really want to just base it off, okay, well, most women, normal thing is this. Because, you know, we know that normal doesn't mean shit anymore, right? So... We want to look at your discharge, right? If you are a woman that doesn't usually discharge and you find that you discharge at a certain, you, you, you discharge like ever so often through the month you discharge, check that out. If you're tracking your period, they're going to tell you, oh, you will be ovulating in the next two days. And they tell you your high day of ovulation in terms of fertility and your low day and your regular days, right? We want to make sure that that calendar when it comes to ovulation and literally what is happening in your vagina or coming out of what is happening in your reproductive system and coming out of your vagina, which would be that discharge mucusy kind of stretchy, more stretchy um, discharge. We want to make sure it's at the same time. So if you realize that you're getting this, but it's not saying that on your calendar, fuck the calendar. You now have to put in your calendar oh, I'm ovulating on the 29th instead of the calendar thinking you should have ovulated from the 20th, okay? So the mucus itself or discharge is a way to tell. Another thing is some women get a cramping or a turning or some kind of movement in the sides of the pelvis, which is where the ovaries would be, okay? Not every woman gets this. Um, they might get it, but they might not feel it, okay? But for me, I feel like there are wheels turning. That's what it feels for me. I know some women feel like it's a cramp, okay? For me, I feel like it's a wheel turning and like one wheel turns and then the other wheel on the other side turns sometimes and then sometimes both turn at the same time. And this will be through the whole six, five days, of ovulation right I'll feel on and off that but your ovulation should not be painful you should like rec recognize that hmm you know like something's going on you know but not be bothered you shouldn't it shouldn't change up your day it shouldn't change up your vibes it shouldn't change up what you have to wear just like your periods it shouldn't change up anything but the fact that you might feel a little cramp or a little nudge or a little funniness in the um in the sides that's fine that's normal but when we start getting to pain that's a problem and that's what i used to suffer from i always knew when i was ovulating because it would be so painful for me but i was suffering from a condition called amblyomyosis and with that condition <clears throat> it affects your uterus and it affects your 
ovulation. Like ovulation was more painful for me than even my period. My period was not as painful as the ovulation. Ovulation was horrible. So if you are feeling pain during ovulation, you got to look into that. Something is going on. 100% something is going on. Cramps, migraine, and back pain when you're ovulating? Hmm. That's a lot going on. I'm going to want you to look into that. Okay, brown eyes? I want you to look into that for sure. Or brownie eyes? I want you to look into that. Okay? Do you think this is coincidental or a good effect from mm -hmm. supplements well i mean spotting during the period i mean during ovulation is not something you want to happen it happens mm -hmm. sometimes okay and it might not be an overly red flag if it's not happening every ovulation time but you should not be bleeding during ovulation you should not be so if you're bleeding during ovulation, there's an issue. Okay, so ovarian cysts. So someone's asking about ovarian cysts, right? Um, I had a cyst in college. Oh my God, I had like so many things. Anyway, so I had cysts in college and... Um, I didn't know I had the cyst, right? Uh, but every so often, especially when I would pick up like a package, like I was away in college, I'm the only child. And so my mom would just like send me packages, like every two weeks there'd be like packages and packages coming for me of all kind of things that I used to like, you know, when I was living at home that she knew I would eat um or you know things she saw that i'd probably like or need or whatever she's one of those moms right so she'd be sending me boxes all the time and i found that like my dorm was you know a good way from the post box the post office in on campus and i would lift up the box and i would walk over or i would ask a friend to carry me over but when i would lift the box sometimes and just position myself lifting the box and stand up sometimes i would always feel this really sharp pain like a sharp pain like in my belly like in my i don't know it's i i don't think then i was thinking it was my ovaries i just used to think it was like my lower abdomen right and it would just like stick me and it would be like this huge stick and jam it would not last for long but the intensity of that one juke was just horrible. That one, like, uh, stab. When I was there, probably like six months after, it was night. I think it was like a Saturday night. I was at my dorm and I f went into complete pain. Like, I felt like somebody, I literally felt like I was going to die. I thought I was going to die. And I didn't know what was going on, what happened. My, my roommates called the ambulance. The ambulance came for me, took me there to the hospital. I was there at the hospital. And I realized that I had a cyst. And the cyst ruptured. And the ruptured cyst was all of that freaking pain that I was feeling. And all I could think was, what? Are you insane? Because of course I'm thinking, okay, maybe it's my appendix. Oh my God, I don't even know, I'm dying. And here it was that it was a cyst. I don't know how big, I don't know how small, because of course, I wasn't going to the doctor doing ultrasounds on a regular basis to see if the cyst was, if I had a cyst or what the case was. I wasn't thinking about that, right? And it so happened that I had a cyst and I had two of them. One burst, right? I guess it ruptured because of, I guess, of the size of it or maybe my movement because I did a lot of things in college as well in terms of movement, um, sports and, you know, that kind of thing. So I'm not sure if that is what happened, uh, but there was another one and they gave me like a lot of antibiotics and all this kind of stuff and Ray, right? Me telling you that story is just to tell you that in terms of the cyst itself, right? Most times it is a pain that you feel. Cysts are usually painful. Like even in the breasts, cysts are usually painful. When it comes to like a cancer tumor kind of thing, you find that usually those aren't as painful. They aren't as painful. Whereas a cyst in the breast, it hurts. It hurts, right? So you can have cysts in the breast, you can have the cysts, um, around your ovaries 
So don't think that cysts are just, oh, just around my ovary like that, right? Another thing about cysts, and I'm sorry I'm going so long about cysts, but cysts, there's a lot to talk about. Another thing with cysts is that you have a thing called PCOS, which are also cysts. So you have the simple cysts, right? And then you have this other thing called a PCOS, which is polycystic ovarian syndrome. And the poly is going to mean many. So it's many cysts. But it's many small cysts. It's not like these big, huge cysts, like a simple cyst that would like burst and put me in the situation I was in. So it's very small cysts, and it's around the ovary. Could be around one ovary, could be around both ovaries. Some women could have... 10 around their ovaries, each ovary, and some could have 20 something. I remember having a client, she was um, 16, and she had 22 cysts around one ovary alone, and the other ovary was like 17 of them or something like that. There was a lot of them, right? Cysts are an estrogen condition. It is estrogen. No matter what type of cyst you have, your cyst could be full with blood. Your cyst could be full with pus. It could be full with <clears throat> anything. At the end of the day, a cyst means that your estrogen level is way too high. Too high. And you usually find that people that end up with cysts it is because of some kind of birth control or some kind of intervention that made them have that condition. It's not like fibroids. Fibroids, you don't usually find that women go on birth control early and then just have like all these fibroids. You know, that doesn't usually happen, right? But with cysts, it does, right? With PCOS, it does. It happens so, so much. So we want to understand that with any type of cyst, the estrogen level is high. That is what the issue is. So we have to lower the estrogen level. How do we lower our estrogen level? The first thing we do is we stop eating foods with freaking estrogen, right? The soy, the dairy, the chicken, the beef, the whatever, the, the, the fish and the seafood that they mm -hmm. pump with these types of things. We have to look at that, right? You're not going to come to me and say, oh, Ramon, I want you to help me with my cyst or my fibroid or my whatever the case is and think that you're not going to have to change your diet. You're going to have to change your diet. It makes no sense. It makes no sense for you to spend $100, $200, $300 a month, every other month, whatever the case is, to take things that are trying to rid you of the things that you are putting in your body on a daily basis. It's a waste of money. It's a waste of time in taking those things. It's a waste of everyone's time, right? So your diet has to change. For some, it's easy, you know, or easier, or they're more willing. For some, it's much harder. They can't understand. So you take it one step at a time. You transition. The transition thing is really, really, really important, right? So take it one step at a time. You can't take everything out of your diet one time. You cut it little by little by little. But you have to cut it. It's a must to cut it. Mm -hmm. All right. All right. Let's move on. Hey, love. If you wake up every day with a wet cookie, is that normal? Wet. Describe that wet. Is it wet because you think like there is like discharge? Is there discharge? Is is your is the is the cookie leaking? <laughs> what is what is happening with the cookie? Tell me that. Explain that to me and then I can give you a little bit more because I mean there should not be any over amount abundant amount of wetness, right? Um some women are a little bit wetter than others and that's okay. Uh, but if you find that, you know, you are sweating in your vagina a lot more or you're having a lot of discharge every day, all day, there's just a lot of discharge, then there's something we definitely want to do about that, right? But go a little bit more into that um, so that I can give you a better answer. What should you do if you're, if you're experience that? Experience what? The sharp pain? I'm not sure what you mean. If you mean the experiencing the sharp pain, go do an ultrasound. 
If they say you have a cyst, send me a message. Let me help you get rid of it or shrink it or whatever. Balance the hormones, basically. Yeah, the ruptured. It happens. It happens. Good night. What do you suggest I use for irregular cycles? I get those sharp stabbing pain too, but my doc says there's no cysts on the ovaries. Okay. Um, if your periods are irregular, that's where we want to start, which means that there's a hormonal issue if your period is irregular, right? So we want to regulate your period. We want to balance your hormones. So your period comes naturally every month without you having to be doing anything at all. It just comes because it's supposed to and come on, you know, the right time, the right, not necessarily literally the time, but the right day, right? Um, that it would have been expected. That is what we want. So balancing your hormones are going to be really important. And I'm sure if we balance the hormones, those stabbing, stabbing pains are going to go away as well. Okay. Um, of course, I'm going to suggest a consultation because it allows me to do my job better because I know more, right? More about your situation, more about your history, more about your goals as well, which is also important. Um, but for an irregular period, just off the top of my head, what I can tell you is going on red maca would be really good. Um, it is a powder. Uh, it's a root, but they grind it up in a powder form. You can get that. We have that on the website. So you can get it in Jamaica if you're here. Um, I would also suggest evening primrose. It helps to really balance the hormones. You want to make sure your evening primrose doesn't have too many mix-up and things in them, right? You really just want something that is just evening primrose, right? Um, so I would go on that as well if I were you. Um, our womb tea is really great for helping to balance the hormones, but our hormonal tea blend is actually really good because we're balancing the hormones now. Now we're getting into the liver aspect of it and removing a lot of the estrogen or whatever uh, hormone that's abundant that shouldn't be that abundant and removing it from the liver. And you find that when we do that, everything just starts to balance out and it just becomes like beautiful music. <laughs> Hi, Chantal. How are you, my darling? Yeah, the sharp pains. I have a cyst now and have to do surgery. You don't have to do surgery. You do not have to do surgery at all. We can figure out the cyst thing, okay? Um, get them shrinked and gone away. And, of course, removing your... My issue with surgery, okay? And this is just across the board. My issue with surgery is... The environment that created the condition, may it be fibroids, may it be cysts, may it be polyps, may it be what the hell ever, okay? The environment that created this thing, what happens to the environment when you cut it out? Does the environment change other than the fact that this mass is now removed? No, it doesn't. The same environment that created this mass that we're going to now do surgery for, that same environment stays even when the mass is gone. So what happens? The environment then produces another mass or masses, right? Because usually when we cut out one mass, three come back, unfortunately. I hate that, but that's just what happens. So... Doing surgery for those types of hormonal things always like make me feel a little uncomfortable because I know that it's going to come back and it's going to come back with a vengeance. And then what are you going to do? You're going to do another surgery and then three years later it's going to come back and it does another surgery or it comes back in a different form. So this time it came as cysts and you cut it from the cysts around your over and you cut it. The next time it came as cysts like in your breasts and you take it out or they leak it or they drain it or whatever the heck you do with it, right? And then you find next that now there is some other, there is some cancerous thing or there is some other estrogen driven condition that you get, endometriosis and then meiosis, something, something that has this estrogen element to it, right? Because it's all connected. If you suffer from cysts, you are closer to being able to have breast cancer or any other cancer 
right, that is an estrogen driven type of cancer than someone who has never had a cyst. Because your body is already abundant with the freaking estrogen. Crazily abundant. So it's going to affect other parts of your body. It's not just going to be like just your womb alone or just your ovary alone or just you. It affects it. So what we want to do is we want to change the environment that created this. And then you realize that it just never freaking comes back. Ever comes back. I used Diane 35 to make it better, but it actually got worse. Can't even go bathroom. What did you take for it? Yes. So that is another thing that is really an issue. Um, and I guess this is one of the things why a lot of OBGYNs don't enjoy my company. <laughs> and it's so sad because I enjoy their company. But the reason why is because... They take this birth control thing and they make it seem like they can use this birth control and heal you and fix you and make you better and you'll be the best version of yourself reproductively because, you know, you're on this birth control. And you do it and you take it and you realize that, oh my God, so I came here with cysts but now I have freaking fibroids or I came here with this and now I have that or it made my period so much better I have no pain. I have no nothing. Everything is great. Everything is wonderful. And I've been on it for the past 17 years. And oh my God, my periods are short. They're pain. They're pain free. I don't have a problem. And then you come off the birth control because now you're trying to get pregnant and it takes forever for the birth control to come out of your system. And then as it comes out of your system, you feel more pain and you can't understand what's going on and your ultrasounds and all these things look normal, but then you're having more pain during your periods or uncomfortableness during your periods. Why? It's the birth control. The birth control numbed a lot of crap and in numbing the crap that it, you intended to, to take it for to numb, it fucked up some other shit over here on the other side right? So birth control is really not the answer. It is not. If you are just trying to not get pregnant and you don't want to get pregnant and that is your main thing, then you do birth control for that. Are there side effects? Are there? Yes, there are. So you want to kind of look into that, right? But if you are trying to use birth control to heal a reproductive condition, if you're trying to use birth control to heal a hormonal situation, that is not the answer. It's not the answer. Get to the root of the problem. Get to the root and then you won't have a problem anymore because you fixed it from the foundation. Trust me. I have that too, polycystic ovarian syndrome. So prone to cysts, but cysts can come and go without you even knowing. They can. They can. And most women do have a cyst that might come up and then it just goes away. And they're very small and they don't affect anything and they don't have any symptoms of anything and it's not throwing off their fertility and it's not throwing off their daily routine and it's not throwing off their periods or any or ovulation or anything like that. But when it is that we are now realizing that this cyst is getting bigger and bigger and bigger or you're having more and more and more, then we know that there is definitely an issue or your periods or your ovulation is thrown off because of this cyst, then we know that there's a problem for sure. I've got a big one on the left and a fibroid on the right. Okay. Fibroids and cysts. Two things in common. I just spoke about this. What is that? It's estrogen. No, one thing in common. Estrogen. Estrogen, estrogen, estrogen. You have to lower your estrogen. You have to change your diet. You have got to change your diet. The pork, the beef, the liver, the kidney, the chicken, it's got to go. It's got to go. Slowly but surely, transition, not a problem, but it has to go. Because your fibroid is only going to get that bigger. The dairy has to go. The fibroid is going to get bigger. And the cyst is going to get bigger and then it might rupture and it's horrible when it ruptures. Um, or you're going to grow more cysts. So you want to change your diet. 
but you also want to make sure that you are balancing your hormones okay your estrogen levels are high you need to look into everything even your lotions if you're even using natural lotion and you see it says soybean or soybean oil you cannot use that please look at the things you're using on your body your skin is your largest organ please be careful Yes, PCOS can definitely affect your fertility, 100%. I would say the majority of my clients these days, PCOS is what they're suffering from. Yeah, some have fibroids. Yeah, some have endometriosis. Yeah, some have whatever else. But PCOS is definitely the highest on the list by far. The margin is very, very, very high compared to the others. So, uh, yeah, it's PCOS is just, it just does. It affects the fertility because it's affecting the ovaries. And the ovaries are what helps you to ovulate. So if you're not ovulating, fertility is not going to naturally happen. Some women suffer from PCS, don't get a period every month. That's probably not, fertility is harder to happen if you're not having a period every month. Some have a lot of male hormones, so they're growing hair on their chin and in their neck and in their um, nipples and all that kind of thing. Having a male hormone will also make you not ovulate. So yes, PCOS will definitely affect you negatively, 100%, unfortunately. Hi, beautiful. <laughs> yeah, don't don't make a don't make a, a practice out of the birth control thing for mm -hmm. sure. Crazy because I'm taking anti estrogen pills and I still get them. Yeah, because your body has so much. Your body has a lot of it, right? So what you need to do is you need to remove, as I said, the food is huge. But you need to remove it from your liver. It's the liver, Chantal. It's the liver. Okay? If you remove the extra estrogen from your liver, you're going to realize all of these different estrogen conditions that you're dealing with or have dealt with or could deal with in the future will not be your reality anymore. Okay? And then what happens is if you're taking anti-estrogen pills, right, you're also messing with your liver more because these things are putting more stress on your liver. So your liver is actually quite stressed out, quite stressed out. So detoxing the liver, strengthening the liver, that's definitely what we'd want to work on or one of the things we would want to work on. Apart from contraceptives, what contributes to PCOS? It depends on the PCOS that you have. Um, it can be the male hormone, um, one of the male hormones that's in your body that's very high. Um, usually a lot of it is uh, insulin resistant. Um, PCOS, which means the liver, of course, is not doing what it needs to do. The liver itself is extra stressed. Um, but dairy is a huge thing. Okay. Um... Dairy is very huge. Anything that has hormones in them is going to be huge. Anything with soy would also be huge in terms of um, increasing that estrogen level. So all them veggie chunks and some of those veggie foods that you're eating, um, please check. Make sure there's no soy. Okay. All cysts, no matter what it is, could have blood in it or it could have anything else in it, pus or whatever. They're all because of the estrogen level. It's the estrogen level. Can fibroids in the breast go into surgery? You mean do surgery for a fibroid in the breast? Yes, you can definitely do a surgery for fibroid in the breast if that's what you're asking me, okay? And the fibroid in the breast is no different. Remember, the breast is a part of the reproductive system. Please remember that, okay? So, yes, it can definitely happen in the breast. So, yes, you would want to take it out. Um, if you want to opt and do surgery, you'd want to take it out of the breast if you want. If Could I have PCOS not and not have irregular periods? Yes. You can suffer from PCOS and still get a period every single month. Yes. So that is something to think about. Okay, so it's not just about missing the period, which is why it's important to get your transvaginal pelvic ultrasound and also your blood tests 
to look at your hormone levels. It's important, especially when you're suffering. If you're suffering from certain types of periods or certain types of pain or discomfort or whatever, then yeah, get the freaking test done. Get them done so we know what we're working with and then we can get the show on the freaking road. Hi, my soul. Hi, my honey. I love you so much. Oh gosh, I miss you. Okay, actually, we have to do a live together. We have to talk about that. But yes, um, PCOS can cause insulin resistance as well. Yes, and that's what I'm saying. So PCOS comes in many forms, many fashions. It just depends. Not all women that suffer from PCOS have um, <clears throat> need some water. I've been talking a lot today. <coughs> Not all women that, women that suffer from PCOS have this male hormone thing. Not every woman that suffer from PCOS has an um, insulin issue as well. So it really just depends. Everyone is different. Please give me one sec. My throat. So sorry about that. Do castor oil kits really work? Yes, they do. They do. If you come to me for a consultation, I am sure a castor oil treatment will be on your treatment plan. Yes, castor oil treatments work. They work for sure. If you have fibroids, if you have cysts, if you have endometriosis, if you have andenmyosis, if you have pelvic inflammatory disease, if you have cancer, if you have diabetes, if you have kidney issue, if you have, I don't care what the hell you have, right? What makes castor oil treatment so awesome is that it tackles so many different systems all at one time. And it's quite simple to do. So the castor oil system detoxes, number one, your reproductive system. So if you have something that's going on in the reproductive system that should not be going on, then detoxing it might be a good thing. So we're detoxing the reproductive. Then we also detoxing the digestive, okay? Which is also great because remember, everything starts in the gut. I'm tired of telling people this. It's all about the gut. That's why we're always going to go back to foods, okay? Everything starts in the gut. You could have autism. You could have infertility. You And I hate the in. You could have fertility situations. You could have schizophrenia you could have um polyps you could have any kind of whatever it all starts in the gut okay the good bacteria is not as much as the bad bacteria and so it just creates this negative entity or negative vibe in your digestive system in your gut okay so the castor oil treatment is going to detox your reproductive system, your digest digestive system. It also helps to flush your lymphatic system. And you, it's funny how we don't really talk a lot. I mean, I talk a lot about the lymphatic system, but in general, you don't hear a lot about it. Um, even during this COVID time, um, you might hear about immune system, might, um, but you're still not even hearing about lymphatic. And the lymphatic system, definitely, if you are suffering from any kind of asthma, sinus, any kind of um, swollen lymph nodes, anything like that, you're going to want to do your castor oil treatment. So that is also a plus, the lymphatic system um, becoming a healthier version of itself. It also helps with circulation. And circulation is also one of those things we don't talk about and it creates so many issues in the body, okay? So it helps to promote healthy circulation as well. So by the time you have dealt into the circulatory system and healed it, um, healed the reproductive system and detoxed it, detox the digestive system, flush out the lymphatic system, you find that the body in itself just works so much freaking better. You've detoxed and removed half of the madness out of it. And again, as I said, it is very, very, very easy. 
okay? You use your cold pressed organic castor oil, you get your cloth, it has to be a flannel cloth or muslin cloth, you have to make sure it has no dyes or anything like that, you get a heating pad or a hot water bottle, you saturate your abdomen from your belly button down to the mound of your vagina or penis, you put the cloth over it, you put the heating pad over that, you put another sheet or something if you want on top of it and you lie the hell down for an hour when you're finished you wipe off you clean off the, the thing if you can bathe after great and you keep it freaking moving okay but castor oil treatments definitely work it does help with fertility yes because it's it's cleansing and cleaning a lot of things remember when it comes to fertility the liver the the kidney is important okay your lymphatic system is important so in us cleaning up these things and fixing up these things you're gonna find that fertility is more possible yes what do you recommend for young girls with terrible cramps okay so depending on how young she is um but i would definitely suggest red raspberry red raspberry mix some chamomile with that um and give that to her okay i would definitely recommend that uh you can also try our womb tea as well you can try that um that has chamomile that has red raspberry but it has a lot of other things too like dandelion and um and nettle and peppermint and all these other kinds of stuff as well but if she is ha if a young girl is having painful cramps it is a sign that something is going on so she needs to go and do a pelvic ultrasound she needs to go and do one a transvaginal pelvic ultrasound we need to know why is she in so much pain is it that her uterus is weak is it that there's scar tissue going on what is happening so please take her for an ultrasound but using some red raspberry and some chamomile mixed together or getting a cosmic woman's womb tea should help should help her but there's something going on if she's having terrible pains I recently had an infection on my cervix and was treated for it, but my period was due today, but I keep getting on and off slight pain on my right side of my ovary. Um, okay, so I'm not sure when you're supposed to do a follow-up. Um, if you're supposed to do a follow-up, if it was just like some antibiotics that you were given for the cervix or something to insert or both. Um... It's hard for me to really say what's going on. Um, I don't really have enough information. Uh, but what I suggest you do is write down these things, okay? Especially if you know that every so often things happen reproductively or whatever in your body. Get a journal, write these things down, or put notes in your phone or something under the calendar um, so that you can see what's going on. Uh, if you were coming to me for treatment after doing a consultation, um, I would definitely um look into that pain aspect what that is um what kind of pain are you having by the way is it a sharp pain is it a is it a constant pain is it a i mean what's what's really happening <laughs> well i we're gonna do something uh miss naomi mm -hmm. What causes an enlarged uterus? Okay, so usually that's inflammation. Usually it's information, in inflammation. So things for inflammation like ginger, turmeric, those are like basic household things that are great, great, great for inflammation. You can do that. Um, I would also say red raspberry. It's great for the uterus. Great, great for the uterus. Um, but I would say usually enlarged uterus is usually an inflammation that's happening. What about ladies trying to get pregnant? Hmm. Well, 
I mean, in terms of the castor oil treatment, yes, it's great. I mean, if you're trying to get pregnant, that's something you can definitely add to your weekly routine to help that process. Um, but when it comes to getting pregnant, it's there's so many different angles that it's hard for me to say. I could sit down here talking for three months about all different ways to get pregnant, just depending on what's going on. I mean, you could be getting, you could, it could be not getting, it could not, pregnancy could not be happening because either you're not ovulating, something's going on with the tubes, the uterine lining is too thin, um, the blood is not clean, um, the sperm isn't enough, not moving fast enough. I mean, there are many things that could be happening. Okay, I'll see you soon. What do I have to get rid of PCOS? Okay, so we spoke a lot about PCOS tonight, and I would tell you, hands down, if you have PCOS and you would like to remove PCOS out of your life, please set a consultation. Please set a consultation. If you are doing a phone consultation, it's 100 US. If it is a phone consultation with an in-person treatment, it is 150 US. Do it so you can get your treatment plans, you can get the guidance, you can get what you want. Everyone here on this live who has been on Cosmic Woman's page and seen the testimonials, these are all women who have done consultations. It's what works instead of us sitting here and guessing. You can't call a doctor and say, hey doc, I think I have an infection. Can you send a prescription into the pharmacy for me? No. The doctor is going to say, come in, let me check you, let me this, let me that. You want to know. They're going to want to know. Same thing with me. I want to know. And I don't want people coming in to see me all the dang time. Because this is you healing yourself. I am just kind of guiding you and supporting you. But you're doing the healing. You're doing the work. Right? So you shouldn't have to pay me for you doing the work. You need to do the work. But... I can't tell you what to do and how to do it if I don't know everything that I need to know. So I'm always going to suggest a consultation when we're looking at things like PCOS, when we're looking at things like um, cysts, when we're looking at things like fibroids, endometriosis, all of that. If you have a yeast infection issue or a bacterial vaginosis issue, you don't need to come and see me. I don't need to see you. I don't need to look in your vagina. I don't need to see you. Okay? But if you are coming to me for these types of other conditions that come in short, different shapes, forms, fashions, I need to see you. Okay? Or I need to have a consultation with you. Because the majority of the time, I don't even know what my clients look like because I've never seen them before ever in my life. Feeling excited, just made a payment to start my treatment. Awesome, awesome. I'm excited for you too, goddess. If you guys want to know about pregnancy and getting pregnant, as I said, just please, just send us a DM or send us a WhatsApp message um, and we can get a little bit more into that for you. But we're going to suggest a consultation because, of course, that allows us to know more. I think I might, I think I need something strong for my fibroids. Okay, well, I mean, we got you. If you need something for the fibroids to shrink them, we can definitely help. Fibroids in the breast would be treated the same way as if it was fibroids in um, the uterus or outside of the uterus. The same exact way. But you need a consultation, goddess. Hi, Ramona, lady, she's the best. I finally have my baby girl after 10 miscarriages. Oh, I'm so excited for you. And you haven't sent me a picture. Send me a picture. Okay? <laughs> a relative have a fertility issue. She was given a letter to do a surgery. Can I send a letter and you assist her from there, you can definitely send a letter and I can look at it and I can kind of give her some pointers or tell her to do a consultation. But I can look at it and give her a better understanding if that's what she wants. The things we go through as women. It's not because we're women why we go through it. We go through it because we weren't educated. We go through it because we weren't told. 
right? So I know, for example, I have an eight-year-old. She will never go through the reproductive issues that I went through. Never. I don't care if she's prone to it because of DNA and I had the issues, so she must have the issues. She's not going to have them. She's not going to have them because she's going to know. She's going to know and I am going to know. And we will work together to make sure that her reproductive system is healthy. And that's what I want for all of the generation that is coming up, right? They shouldn't have to suffer like our generation. Our generation suffered more than any other generation when it comes to reproductive health in terms of fertility, hormonal issues. We suffered. Our parents didn't suffer like we're suffering. And hopefully our children will not suffer the way that we are suffering, right? But it's just what it is. It was a lack of education. How to prepare the womb tea? One teaspoon in boiling water, seep or steep for five minutes, three minutes, whatever, strain it, drink it. You can also put it in your smoothie if you wish. That is also possible, okay? Can you talk about getting rid of BV? Okay, so they're gonna cut me down, so let me just talk about this real quick. So in terms of BV, there are things you want. Um, BV is usually reoccurring, okay? So you wanna try also try to treat your partner as well. I would suggest you go on our websites, okay, if you're anywhere other than Jamaica, you get the probiotics, you want probiotics, 100 billion cultures is what we give you, or 90, 90 or 100 billion, one of them. Uh, 90 or what, 90 billion or 100 billion. Uh, this is going to put the good bacteria in your body to balance out your pH and all of that type of thing and fight the negative entities that would be in your gut and of course then in your vagina. I also suggest the cleanse as I said. We also do a silver treatment. The silver treatment has collodial silver in it. It is not regular old collodial silver. It is um, actually 500 ppm which is quite strong. You can't just go into the supermarket or go into the pharmacy and find 500 ppm. Uh, but we also use that as well, uh, which you would do an insert of uh, in the vagina, kind of like a monostat type of situation. Uh, but this is the collodial silver, and as, as I said, it is 500 ppm's. Uh, that is what I would suggest. Um, steaming can sometimes help as well, but with the steaming, sometimes the heat makes it a little bit more worse because, of course, the candida is like a fungus. So it really just depends on how bad um, your BV is. Okay, guys, so I am so sorry that I cannot answer all the rest of the questions. They are tuning me out and you know what i was thinking or they're going to in a minute i was really thinking that it is i need to do like a month of just questions and answers like just question and answers you know what i mean like instead of me finding different topics to talk about literally just doing questions and answers because this is how we get somewhere right you ask me a question and i can say hey do this don't do this because sometimes i do the lives and they don't they don't apply to someone else they might watch it because hey you know them like what cosmic woman doing or they respect it or maybe i'm entertaining or maybe they just want to look into my face or maybe they want to see what me i do right because you know you have people that just want to see what you are do um but I really think it's good for me to just for you guys to ask the questions and I really answer them, right? So we're gonna be we're gonna do that. Okay, that's gonna be a plan, I promise, so that we can get more of these questions answered. Thank you guys again for tuning in to Womb Wednesdays as you usually do. I appreciate it. Uh, as you guys know, I am the vagina lady, uh, aka Ramona, or should I say I am Ramona Riley, aka the vagina lady, uh, owner of Cosmic Woman. Uh, I thank you guys for tuning in. If you are not following the vagina lady on IG, please do so. If you have Instagram um, and you're not following, well, you must be following Cosmic Woman if you're on here now, or maybe someone sent it to you, but definitely follow Cosmic Woman. On YouTube, we are there also at, um, on as Cosmic Woman as well, so you can tap into that. Pum Pum 101 starts on the 11th, guys. Don't miss it. I know you guys have been missing out on Pum Pum 101. It is a great show. Um, we have a lot of niceness and newness for you guys, so please look out for that. It is not on a Friday anymore it is on a Thursday um, so 
look out it's gonna be at nine o'clock eight o'clock eight o'clock yes we're putting it we're going down to eight because we have some new kind of vibe thing going on you guys will see but check that out also we have a pelvis strengthening or should i say penis strengthening class tomorrow yesterday was the yoni toning class which was great uh tomorrow is a pelvic strengthening class if anybody wants to sign up their significant other uh you can do so uh just send a message to um the ig cosmic woman page or of course um you can send a whatsapp message to our our office number okay so thanks again guys for tuning in i will see you guys next week same time same place uh, love and light to all of you. There's a full moon tomorrow. So make sure you write down all the things that you want to release. Um, powerful full moon in Leo. You know, Leo is an extremist. They do everything extreme. Um, and of course, there's a lot of courageousness and bravery as well when it comes to it. So anything that you have been wanting to do that you're afraid of doing or worried about doing or watching face about doing, now is the time okay take that courageous time right now and use it right use it to the best um so that you can be the better version of yourself thanks again guys have a great rest of the night love and light to all of you bye bye see you soon <laughs> later